Hey, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us for Church Online today. We're team teaching today. Uh, we're on week four on our series in building great relationships. And this week, we're going to look at love. And the text we'll you'll be using will be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. Yep. <laughs> Trudy, the you love read it? <laughs> chapter. So we're going to start in verse four. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Man, that is a ah, powerful section of scripture. Um, Jesus... Um, exemplified this love when he went to the cross for us didn't he Absolutely. and this is a great place to remember that love that he has for us as we celebrate communion so if you are at home watching this you could pause the video and go get your elements uh, we're going to use these little prepackaged ones here you know um the most famous verse in our bibles quoted at ball games and on posters uh, john three sixteen is a great example of what love love is uh, for God so loved the world. Now, you know, there's no qualifier here. He loved the world. Not just the good people of the world. He loved the world. And um, he loved the world so much that he gave. And this is the essence of love. Self-sacrificial, putting the needs of others ahead of our own. And this is what we celebrate today as we remember um, Jesus' sacrifice. So if you have your little element. Uh-oh, I took the bottom part off first. Now I'm going to make a mess. Sorry. Um, Trudy, why don't you do the bread? <laughs> <laughs> so the night before Jesus was crucified, showing his ultimate love for us, he had dinner with the disciples. And he took the bread and he blessed it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And whenever you do this, remember me. Remember the sacrifice that I've done. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifice. We thank you for the ultimate love that you have shown us. We remember you in the taking of this bread. Yes. Amen. Amen. Then after supper, he, he took the cup. This cup represents uh, the new covenant poured out in his blood. And the precious blood of Jesus for the remission of sin. As often as you do this, remember Jesus. You know, there was one more um, cup in the communion or in the um, Passover celebration and, and Jesus set that aside. He said, I'll drink this one when I come back in my kingdom, in my glory. So communion not only uh, has the time to pause and reflect and look back, but also look ahead um, to his coming again. This is what love is. You know, and as we look ahead, we see different places within history that uh, that also embody that love. Um, for instance, um, during the German invasion of Denmark during World War II, the Nazis planned to take over, over and capture 7,000 Jews on their most sacred of holidays, Rosh Hashanah. And they had this big plan to surprise attack them, but two days before the seizure was to take place, there was... Um, someone in the high ranks of the German army that alerted the Jews, sort of on the DL, on the down low there. And they were able, the Danes and all of their neighbors were able to hide the Jews on this particular holiday. And so when the, the Nazis invaded and they tried to capture everybody, only 407 Jews were <laughs> captured. And they had worked with their neighbors to smuggle them out to Sweden or to put them in attics or to put them in basements. And so they guarded, they safeguarded their neighbors, the ones that they loved. Wow. You know, two years later when the war was over and it was safe for the Jews to come back home, they came back to homes that were taken care of. They came back to gardens that were cultivated and still growing. They came back to their pets being fed. Oh, man. Because they were loved so dearly by their neighbors that the neighbors sacrificed their very lives and their freedoms so that their neighbors, the Jews, could survive and come back to flourishing homes. That's 
the embodiment of love. Oh, yeah. So I'm so glad that we're doing this relationship on love, or on, on series on relationships, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. including love. And we've covered quite a bit so far. I, what an awesome story, though, Trudy. This is love does. It's just not a secondhand emotion like Tina Turner sang, sang about. But um, so far we've covered that communication is the bedrock of any relationship. And then how time is the currency of our relationships. We invest in what we value. And, and time is that currency, that most precious commodity. And this week, um, and, or last week, Trudy talked about um, how relationships just add value to our, to our lives. Uh, and they're necessary for our health and emotional well-being. Um, so today, we're going to look about how love is really the gas of our relationship. It's what propels us forward. Um, just like gas in our car. No love in the relationship, and you'll be stuck on the side of the road, won't you, in your relationship? You know, when I was growing up, my mom always used to tell me that actions speak louder than words. Right. Um, it, it's Love is like faith, right? And James tells us that uh, you tell me you have faith, but I'm going to show you my right. faith by putting it into action. It's kind of like that old song, you know? Love is nothing till you give it away. <laughs> and then you end up getting more. <laughs> Must have been an old Baptist song. I missed that one. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, amen to that. Love is action. Love is is showing that we care. Um, and we all love. We all do. Uh, love motivates everything we do. Um, that's why I'll be glued to the television Sunday, because I love football, you know, the big game of the year. I don't love football enough to spend hundreds of dollars to have the NFL package, but I love it enough to invest an afternoon in it. Um, but we all love something, and it motivates everything we do. It determines what we invest our time and what we spend our money on. So the trick is, for us Christians, is to become so in tune with what God loves that our love reflects the things that He loves. You know, I'm sure God loves football, too. Um, <laughs> but Christian love is not about football. It's about self-denial. It's where, uh, you know, and where sin is primar primarily oriented around self, Christian love is about others. Christian love is a selfless love. Whereas the natural man, one who is controlled by his natural desires, you know, our first question is, what's in it for me, right? Um, but Christians, the first concern, uh, Christians motivated by love, the primary concern for us is, what's in it for the well-being of others, for the well-being of the body? Love does nothing out of selfish ambitions, but considers the needs of others ahead of their own. And the opposite of love is not hate. Right. The opposite of love is actually sin. So if I'm not thinking about you in love, I'm not loving. Don't. Thinking about me, which is very selfish. Very selfish. Um, so while we're in, we're in the great love chapter, probably the most quoted and preached on chapter in the whole Bible, full of great coffee cup verses and great bumper stickers. But it's important to remember that chapter 13 comes right in the middle of of chapter 12 and chapter 14. Oh, you don't say. That's heavy, isn't it? Um, I need to pause and give you note takers a chance to get that down. 13 comes right between 12 and 14. <laughs> oh, maybe I should refresh your memory. What's in 12 and 14? See, uh, chapter 12 just talks about how the body has many parts. And he's talking about how we're all interconnected and that we need each other. And he's talking about the spiritual gifts. You know, even the appendix among us is essential. Um, we just don't know why, right? But the mission of God is a every member mission. Uh, we're needed and necessary, so it's important for each of us to determine who God created us to be and, and develop and use our spiritual gifts. And then, in chapter 14, he talks about how to exercise our gifts. But we do so in the context of love. And chapter ends with, now I'll show you a more excellent way. You know, gifts are important, but love is a field where all Christian people thrive and flourish. Uh, love according to how God loves and what He loves. Now, God is love, and love comes from Him, and we love because He first loved us. But love is lived out in community, in relationships. You know, love is not a spiritual gift. We have all these spiritual gifts that, you know, are bestowed upon us, but love is a life of surrender. Mm -hmm. As we lay down our selfish wills, then the Holy Spirit comes in, and God is love. So when we have God in us, we are love. Yep. You know, chapter 13 starts out reminding us uh, to do all, thing God, all the things that God has for us to do. Uh, you know, all these things, even selfless acts. You could even die a martyr 
And you can surrender your body to the flames and die a horrible death. But without love, it's it's worthless. It says you're a clanging cymbal. Just <laughs> out here banging and making a lot of noise and you're no good. Yep. So a Christian love is, is selfless love. Um, a life without love, though, is worthless. All these great acts, if you don't do them in love, they're nothing. You know, and, and that being said, that doesn't mean we don't love ourselves. We just don't elevate the love of self ahead of anyone else. Right, you know, and, and when we think about putting someone before us, sometimes we think that that's a way of just being a doormat. You know, you're laying down and you're going to let whomever it is trample all over you in, in the name of love. That's not love. <laughs> you know, I'm going to treat you just as much as I would like to be treated myself, which means I'm going to advocate for you, but I'm not going to allow you to walk all over me. Right. It might be some boundaries, huh? Perhaps. Yeah, you know, there's a common phrase, uh, you know, that God fills our cup to overflowing with his love, and then the love just overflows onto all those around us. You know, that sounds like a really good saying, doesn't it, until you really think about it. But then the root of this saying is self. You know, we're the cup, we're the object of filling, and it should never be about us. It should always be about him. So a better way of thinking would be that just, uh, you know, we're conduits. His love just flows through us. And, you know, we can do this on empty. But we're ambassadors. We represent the king first and foremost. It, you know, it's all about him. Yeah, you bring up a good point here. When we look at the verses, we read, Love does not parade itself. Nope. It is not puffed up. So if we're concerned about the other person, it would stop us from boasting about our goodness. I'm not going to tell you, hey, look at my brand new car when yours might not be running. That's not love. Right. You know, it allows us to be so open and it compels us to show excitement for what others might have when they receive blessings. Not always looking to do a tit for tat. Right. You know, this, this brings about sort of an epiphany for me. We're to practice this love, not only with the individuals that we encounter, but also corporately. You know, when, when the Lord is talking about the, the love of the body of Christ, that's taking into consideration the entire group. So when it says, the, the verse starts out, and it talks about love is patient, love is kind, well, it needs to expand beyond the individuals. Yeah. If we look at the, in the light of loving the body of Christ as a whole, it makes us be more responsible in being patient and being kind. It's essentially a call to stand up sometimes and confront the things that are not exactly in line with love. Right. Kindness towards the body of Christ would say that we may need to confront one another. Those boundaries you were talking about. Someone who might be causing disruption and harmony within the body, that person really needs to be confronted so that no one else gets hurt. Right. I'm not just thinking about that individual person. I'm thinking about the people that they're surrounded by as well. You know, Scripture states that the outside world will know God's people by their love. Yep. That's another sign, right? Yeah. If we don't love each other, our witness is nothing. We are, again, like clanging symbols. <laughs> yeah. You know, nobody said love is going to be easy, but it's worth it because love is what propels our relationships forward. It's the gas in our relationship. You know, without love, our, our relationships can only go so far. Yeah, earlier you said, love is self-denial, questioning what's in it for me, for the well-being of myself before the other. Right. It's also saying what's in it for the well-being of the body, the of, body Christ. of Christ. This is a really a call to advocacy. Here's where it sort of goes into a full big circle. Yeah. You know? Let me read that section again. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Man, love never ends. If we love the body of Christ as we're called to, we would be compelled to confront the brother or sister with their sin and attempt to restore right. them in the mm -hmm. name of love. Absolutely. That love for the individual would state that we do it with long-suffering. We do it with patience, kindness, not behaving rudely or seeking our own agenda or causing iniquity, but bearing all things, believing all things, hoping for all things and enduring all things. All this with the knowledge that love never fails. 
you know, in light of this revelation, can you explain where 1 Peter 4, 8 comes in? If kindness for the body of Christ is addressing sin, why does Peter tell us to cover sin with love? <laughs> That's a great point. A great passage, too, to bring in our discussion on love and you know how it enriches our relationships. It kind of ties back to love believes all things, hopes all things. You know, I think it was Andy Stanley who taught uh, on this gap that we all experience. You know, we think people should act a certain way, they should behave a certain way, but you know, reality doesn't always meet our expectations. Uh, so what do we do when this doesn't happen? Um, this is where love believes um, all things and hopes all things and comes into play and, and gives love, uh, gives a relationship its staying power because we choose to put love in the gap between when reality and expectations don't match. And love chooses to believe the best and, and closes that gap, which brings us to First Pete. Uh, First Peter uh, four eight says, and above all things, have a fervent love for one another, for love will cover over a multitude of sin. I wonder, it might be helpful to look at love as a journey, maybe a path that we're on. We're told to grow in grace and knowledge that we can add love yeah. to this too, to yeah. grow into love. You know, I could honestly say I I love Cheryl more than we did when we first got married. Yeah. And I can love the congregation more now than I did, you know, five years ago. I'm, I'm, we're growing in love. Um, what makes relationships trying so, so sometimes, so I shouldn't say sometimes, but what makes relationships so trying is because at the core are two sinful people. Um, we you know, and me. Yes. <laughs> we know, <And> you. <laughs> we know one day we're going to be transformed into the very likeness of Christ. And then we'll be sin free. Praise Jesus. Oh, yeah. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Huh? I look so forward to the day when there'll be no lust or greed or envy or pride, no ulterior motives in me. You know, love will have completely taken over my body. Oh, happy day. Yeah, no sin in me. <laughs> but until then, we're all just works in progress. And we're constantly dealing with the sins in our own lives, growing out of them, having victory over them as others are being revealed. So love is patient and kind. It doesn't envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. Love is patient with, with people and the progress of others. Sometimes we just want to drag the others forward. You know, but that's the opposite of what love does. Love is patient with their, pro with their progress and, and in kindness, encouraging them along the path of love. I got Cheryl a sweatshirt for Christmas. And it says, uh, in a world where you could be anything, be kind. Mm -hmm. Be kind. Patience and kindness go a long ways in a relationship. It's a great definition of love in action. Love doesn't get behind them with the cattle prod. You know, it doesn't drag them forward. It doesn't become irritable with their speed of growth. And it doesn't envy those who are further along the path. It doesn't boast about being ahead of those who are behind. You know, our relationships move forward as we grow in love. And love covers over a multitude of sins. Like I said earlier, love is the gas of our relationship. And just like that's what propels a car forward, so love propels our relationships forward. So remember, love does. Love's the gas in our relationship. So go out, love, and do. Yep. <laughs> love you guys. Have a great week.